A reading from the book of Numbers. The children of Israel lamented, Would that we had meat for food. We, we remember the fish we used to eat without cost in Egypt, and the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now we are famished. We see nothing before us but this manna. Manna was like coriander seed and had the color of resin. When they had gone about and gathered it up, the people would grind it between millstones or pour it in a mortar, then cook it in a pot and make it into loaves, which tasted like cakes made with oil. At night, when the dew fell upon the camp, the manna also fell. When Moses heard the people, family after family, crying at the entrance of their tents, so that the Lord became very angry, he was grieved. Why do you treat your servants so badly? Moses asked the Lord. Why are you so displeased with me that you burden me with all this people? Was it I who conceived all this people? Or was it I who gave them birth? that you tell me to carry them at my bosom, like a foster father carrying an infant to the land you have promised under oath to their fathers? Where can I get meat to give to all this people? For they are crying to me, give us meat for our food. I cannot carry all this people by myself, for they are too heavy for me. If this is a way you will deal with me, then please do me the favor of killing me at once, so that I need no longer face this distress. <laughs> Sing with joy to God our help. My people heard not my voice, and Israel obeyed me not. So I gave them up to the hardness of their hearts. They walked according to their own counsels. If only my people would hear me, and Israel walk in my ways, quickly would I humble their enemies. Against their foes I would turn my hand. Those who hated the Lord would seek to flatter me, but their fate would endure forever. While Israel I would feed with the best of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would fill them. Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. When Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. 
When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place and it is already late. Dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. He said to them, there is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. And they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied and they picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Febum Domini. <laughs> this past July 22nd, 2013, there was an announcement that many in the world had waited for with great interest. And it was the birth of a, a little boy at London's St. Mary's Hospital who weighed eight pounds and six ounces. And he is a child of Prince William and Princess Catherine uh, of England. The little boy's name George Alexander Lewis. And he is now the third in the line to the British throne after Prince Charles, his father Prince William. He would be the third in the line to the British throne. He is the great, 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 great grandchild of Queen Victoria who ruled at the peak of British power. And he expected, he can be expected one day to become the head of state of 16 countries, including Britain, Australia, and Canada. The little prince, George Alexander Lewis. And people are interested and watch this with great interest, both the wedding of William, Prince William and Kate and now uh, watched also with interest the, the firstborn who would be the one to inherit the throne. And then when we think about the feast that we celebrate today, it's a dedication of the oldest church dedicated to Mary in the West, St. Mary Major. And the story behind the construction of this uh, basilica one of the major basilicas, the four major basilicas in Rome, is that there was some controversy. You know, our Lord said that the Holy Spirit would guide the church, that he gave the keys to Peter, and whatever he bound or loosed on earth would be bound and loosed in heaven. And so throughout Christian history, there's always been different controversies that have brought division that would be resolved by these meeting, ecumenical meetings of all of the bishops of the world under the authority of the Pope that would conclude what is the true doctrine that we are to believe. And so, for example, in Nicaea, in modern day Turkey in the year 325, there was a controversy of Arianism, whether or not Jesus was truly God or whether he was somewhat less than God, whether he was created. As Arius, a priest, was teaching, there was a time when he was not. And so it was this meeting, this ecumenical meeting at Nicaea in 325, that gave us what we profess every Sunday, the Nicene Creed. 
He is God from God. He is light from light. True God from true God. Begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. And so there's a certain satisfaction that comes that, okay, this question has been resolved now. That God has guided the church so that we can know what we are to believe. What is the orthodox? What is the true faith that we should put our faith in? And so in 431, also, there was a bishop by the name of Nestorius who was teaching that wrongly, that there were two distinct persons in Jesus Christ. Two persons. There was one divine person and one human person. So almost like the divine was dwelling in the human. And what the Catholic Church teaching is, is that Jesus is true God and true man. He has two natures, but they're joined together in one divine person. And so Jesus is one person. He has two natures. And so, for example, if we would walk into a dark room and we can't quite see very clearly, but we see something at the end of the room that's moving, the first question we ask is, what is the nature of that thing? What is it? Is it an animal or is it one of my children? And so you're asking, you know, what is the nature of that thing, animal or human? that I see moving. I can't quite make out what it is yet. It's dark. But then once you discover, oh, it's one of my children, then you ask, which person is it? Is it John? Is it Mary? Is it Sue? So that is a distinction you can make between what a nature is, what the nature of a thing is, and who a person is. And that's why we say Jesus has two natures. He is both God and man united in this hypostatic union, but he's one person, one divine person who is both God and man. And so when the Council of Ephesus proclaim that Mary should be called not just the mother of his human nature, but the mother of the person who is God, that she should be called mother of God. That makes sense, doesn't it, if we put it together. It doesn't mean that she's the origin of God from all eternity, of course not. But what it does is that it defends the truth about Jesus Christ. In fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria, in his homily that he gave at the Council of Ephesus, again, that was in 431, he said, Hail Mary, Mother of God, scepter of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means the true faith. And so to defend the truth about Mary is to defend the truth about Jesus Christ, that the one that she bore is God. He's one person, but he has two natures, both divine and human, united in this hypostatic union and so rightly she can be called to defend the truth about the one that she gave birth to, that she is called the mother of God. And so with every Hail Mary that we pray, we defend that truth. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners. And you know, the people outside the council in Ephesus were waiting for the decision. What were they going to decide? Would she be called the Theotokos in Greek, the mother of God? And when they found out the happy results, their shout was raised, they were ecstatic with joy, and they cried out, Theotokos, Theotokos. And there was a torchlight procession that was formed and the bishops were escorted in triumph to their lodgings. All night long, the city was brilliantly Illuminated. You see, there's a sense that the faithful have, that we have the census fidei, this, this sort of sense of the faith that all of us have that, yes, it is right, it is true, and we should and must proclaim the truths about Mary. 
which is the truth about her son, Jesus Christ, that she has a unique dignity among all the women of earth, and that it is true what she said, as recorded in the scriptures, that all generations will call her blessed, because truly she is the most blessed of all women, as Elizabeth cried out, filled with the Holy Spirit. So she is the scepter of orthodoxy. St. Cyril continued in his homily, what man can sing adequately the praise of Mary? And speaking of God, he said, shall the builder be forbidden to inhabit the temple he has built? Shall he be despised who chose his handmaid for his mother? See, all things rejoice. All things rejoice. Cyril points out that God deigned to dwell in Mary, to be born of her. How can we then fail to rejoice in her? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And so after this, Pope Sixtus III erected a basilica at Rome on the Esquiline Hill in honor of the Mother of God, later to be known as Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major, or the great St. Mary's, the oldest church in the West dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so today we celebrate the feast of that dedication, and we ask for her powerful intercession for us, and we also pray in gratitude for her intercession and her assistance of the church throughout the centuries. Here's what the angel Gabriel had said to Mary. <clears throat> and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And so the world watched with great interest as a future heir to the throne in England was born little Prince George Alexander Lewis. But we rejoice all the more that one who is the king of kings, whose reign shall never end, who will inherit the throne of his father David and will reign forever and ever, was born of Mary. That's an even greater cause, of course, for rejoicing for us. And then the final point that I want to make is that sometimes we forget our own dignity. You know, the people of Israel in the first reading from the book of Numbers, they forgot that they were chosen by God to be his people, that they were, they were going to be led to their inheritance, to the promised land. And so they, they started looking back at what they had Oh, the cucumbers, the leeks, the onions. And they were going to renounce their inheritance. They were going to uh, renounce the promised land so that they could go back to what they had before. And you and I are brothers and sisters of Jesus. We who do the will of the Father, we who have been baptized into Christ. St. Paul says, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. And the danger for us is that we begin to look back and we maybe are tempted and allured by the world and all of its loud proclamation for us to join in that wide way that leads to destruction. And so we're tempted to go back to not cucumbers and leeks, but something else by which we renounce our heavenly inheritance, the promised land that God has for us forever. What was the original promised land, but a figure of eternal life and the heavenly inheritance that is ours. 
So let us not, like the children of Israel, look back at what was left behind, because that always is an empty thing anyway. It never brings any satisfaction, only disappointment and frustration. If they would have turned back, they would have never inherited the promised land. And in the gospel, we have a prefigurement of the gift that is ours this morning, the gift of the Eucharist. Did you notice that when Jesus took the loaves and the fish, we heard, and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke it, and gave it. The very same verbs that we use in the Eucharistic prayer. Because this was a figure of how he is going to fill the, how he feeds the multitudes with the gift of the Holy Eucharist, the gift of this bread of eternal life that leads us and sustains us until we reach our inheritance of the promised land forever with God. So let us, my brothers and sisters, keep on the path that is leading us to eternal life and to know that we have divine assistance, that Mary, the mother of God, is also our mother. Behold your mother, Jesus said. He is her mother, the mother of God, but she is also our mother who will assist us on our journey so that we may persevere nourished by the bread of life, the true bread of heaven, that we were privileged to receive this morning and to lead us to that life everlasting, that true promised land of heaven forever, where she is crowned as queen next to Jesus the King forever.